All right, guys, what's going on? So I get a lot of questions all the time about what is the best DLC for Anno 1800? Which DLCs should I be looking at getting? Which seasons should I be looking at getting? And so I thought it'd be really cool to do a little tier list of my thoughts on which DLCs are the best and which ones you could probably skip or aren't as important to the game or just really fell flat on their face. So let's jump in here and take a look at all 12 DLCs for Anno 1800 and my thoughts on where they belong in a ranking. Now, obviously, this is my opinion. If you disagree, let me know down below in the comments and give me your thoughts on where some of these are at. So let's get started with Season 1. Season 1 gave us the Botanica DLC as the very first DLC for Anno 1800. Now, Botanica was a little simple honestly all it did was add a single building uh, a single cultural building that is the botanical garden along with some new sets and everything with some new effects as well as a new expedition type and if you have the world's fair built you can run a new exhibition to get some plants and some ornaments and stuff like that so it didn't add a massive amount of new content to explore just added a little bit more uh overall fun things you could go and do and sets you could work towards that can help out your islands. Now some of the sets are really really good. Sets like the Marshland set that increases happiness and uh, reduces the chance of illness by 50%. The Medicinal set which uh, increases the movement speed of hospitals and doctors by 15% and gives you more doctors. Then obviously there's lots of them that do things like increase productivity for different types of farms and plantations. So there are some really good sets out there that you can use. Uh, but overall, it was kind of just a very simple lackluster uh, first DLC. So I'm going to kind of put this one on down in the C tier. You know, it's um, it's okay. But it's not a must-have. You know, it's it's definitely not a must-have. I wouldn't call it a D tier. Uh, it's not absolutely horrible because it does have some usefulness. But in terms of overall content, I really feel like this should have been a free update or just added into the base game. I really don't feel like it was, uh, It's you know, it should have been charged as extra content. Now we're going into the big one that is everyone's, most everyone's favorite, and it is Sunken Treasures. Sunken Treasures adds the much beloved and sometimes much maligned uh, Cape Trelawney and Crown Falls, the go-to place to build your cities. Now, I do have a full video called Do You Have Crown Falls Syndrome? And if you are interested in hearing my thoughts on Crown Falls itself, be sure to check out that video. It is popping up in the upper right corner of your screen and down below in the description. Um, Crown Falls is a kind of one of those things where it's amazing and it's a lot of fun to build on, but it is very static. Uh, it is completely static, as a matter of fact, a as in it never changes. It's always the same landmass. Um, the only thing that really changes is maybe the distribution of resources on it, depending on difficulty settings you're playing on. But other than that, the region is always the same. The map, well, the, the map is always the same and the region is relatively the same. It's also a very quiet and dull, boring region. There's no pirates. There's only one neutral trader there, and that being old Nate, who only ever has a single ship that he sends around to all the islands. So passive trade is completely a, just not a factor in that region unless you have AI opponents in the region that you have trade agreements with. It's really just a very boring region, to be honest. Uh, and Crown Falls, while it's a lovely, huge landmass to build on, does get very samey after a while. And, it, you know, the quest line is okay, but you kind of, you know, get through it pretty quickly. So it's, it's not bad. It's a good DLC. You know, it does give you the opportunity to build a lot of stuff on it. The biggest problem with Sunken Treasures and Crown Falls is that you can really tell that all subsequent DLCs uh, that were made for big cities were built with Crown Falls in mind. And we'll talk about that more when we get to those DLCs later. Uh, Sunken Treasures is obviously a, a good DLC because it did add you know, new land masses. It added the new diving mechanic, which I know a lot of people actually ended up hating because it's very tedious and time consuming. But it is a really good DLC. And I'm going to put that up in the A tier for this one. It's not S tier. It's not like mm, Chef's Kiss. But it is really good for what it added and the foundation it built for later content. 
The Passage DLC was the third and final DLC for Season 1, and it is one of my uh, one of my top favorite DLCs, honestly. A lot of people struggle with the Arctic and struggle building there. Uh, I find that region very, very, honestly, very simple to build in and a lot of fun. It gave us our first airship and everything, and it was the only airship until Empire of the Skies came out uh, in Season 4. So the airship was really, really cool and very powerful. The uh, the gas mines and having the gas power plants uh, completely changed how you supplied electricity to your cities and everything. It was an amazing DLC. I really liked it. It came with a lot of new sets and everything as well that were very, very powerful for your museums and zoos. So I really, really love the passage. The storyline was really good. Uh, it also gave you some nice injections. It also gave you some nice injections of cash, which was really helpful early on, especially in that engineer phase where things can get a little tight. And this was before a lot of the cheats and everything, such as Docklands and the uh, flips of pocket watches and things like that. Money used to be a little bit more difficult to come by. So having those injections of cash from Lady Jane Faithful in the passage was really, really strong. Overall, I think the passage kind of set the bar uh, for later big content DLCs. And I thought it was a really well done and well executed DLC. And it definitely belongs in the S tier. It was a very, very solid, solid DLC in terms of content and what it gave us to go on from there. And it was a great way to uh, finish off the season one content. Now moving into season two, season two started off with the Seat of Power, the Palace DLC. Uh, Seat of Power is probably one, one of the more powerful DLCs out there. Uh, it gives us all of the policies and everything across our island as the palace itself, and then you can build the local departments on other islands that give you localized effects of a single department across, you know, on that island within the range of half the range of the palace and everything is a really, really cool DLC. The effects of the departments can be multiplied as you reach different prestige levels, as you increase your attractiveness. It was absolutely awesome. Now, some of the policies are kind of hit and miss. Um, a lot of them are very you just never take them there's a lot of policies you never never take in the palace and everything and there are some policies that you always default to and you'll always use so um really great concept an amazing concept for a dlc uh, but some of the policies do fall pretty flat and everything and are never taken and are just kind of useless overall the amount of attractiveness that you need to reach the maximum prestige and everything on the palace is a 33,000 attractiveness, which is very difficult to get to. And that is definitely a long-term goal to reach that amount of attractiveness, as well as having enough population. I, be, I can't remember off the top of my head the amount of population you need. It's, it's in the hundreds of thousands, I believe, maybe close to a million, something like that. A population you need to get the uh, maximum range, essentially, to cover all of Crown Falls with the palace. And obviously, by that point, even half of that will cover the half of that that the local departments pick up will cover a large island of a standard large island. So the Seed of Power, again, really great DLC, gave us the very powerful effects from the uh, different departments and everything, the baseline effects as well as the policies. But some of the policies weren't so amazing, but it's still one of those that you definitely want to get and you definitely want to start building this as soon as you have the funds to support it and to start adding on to it and get those policies going because it is a game-changing type of DLC. So it definitely belongs in the A tier. I would put it up in the S tier if the policies were more powerful and impactful and you had a lot more choice and decisions to make. But there are quite a few policies in different departments that are just, you just never take them, to be honest. And they're really not that great. So definitely an A tier, just not S tier. Next up in Season 2, we got Bright Harvest. Now, Bright Harvest was, it, it, that is a Chef's Kiss DLC. It completely revolutionized how you did your animal farms and your agricultural farms. Having silos uh, producing an additional 100% plus an additional output of goods every third cycle. 
the tractor barns uh, being supplied by the fuel, so another use for oil, which you always have an abundance of, adding an additional 200% productivity, as well as the additional product every third cycle, completely changed everything. It completely changed how you did your farms. It really brought that industrial revolution feel into the game and really made you feel like you're in the industrial revolution. You know, now your farms and stuff are no longer just being, you know, managed and, you know, worked over by people. Now you have your tractors out there doing things and you can see the revel the industrial revolution happening in real time in front of your face as you upgrade those farms. Um, it, it just, it reduced the number of farms you needed overall, and it was such an amazing DLC. It is one of those that I think everybody should get, and it is most definitely an S-tier class DLC because of the amount of game-changing content that it brought along. Finishing off Season 2, we had Land of Lions, what I consider the capstone of amazing content and story writing by Ubisoft Minds. Land Alliance took us to Mbessa and had the massive quest line with Emperor Katima, as well as the optional quest line to unite all of Mbessa under his banner once again, giving us some decent regional bonuses. Uh, the one that really, the only two that really mattered was the additional research points from Elders for bringing Caduce and Atoni under rule, as well as the plus 10 to canal tile, uh, plus 10 to canal tiles for uh, bringing Wahadesher. The the one for Angarab was increasing the range of fire stations, which, okay, whatever. It's not a big deal. But the other two are really, really good. Uh, Land of Lions was a phenomenal storytelling. I know a lot of people just got really tired of the story and everything, and if you didn't know, you don't actually have to do the storyline for Land of Lions to get all of the different bonuses and to get the different stuff for it. Uh, so if you're interested in that, again, I do have a video popping up in the upper right corner, as well as down in the description below about how you can skip Land of Lions content and still get everything that you need. So you don't have to worry about going through all that. I believe there's also a mod now out there that com that auto completes Land of Lions and gives you everything that you need as soon as you enter the region. So that's another option if you just want to throw a mod in there. So th you can search for that on mod.io within the game. Obviously, this is PC only. But yeah, you can look for that mod and everything. I think I forgot what it's called. I think it's called like Perfect Land of Lions ending or something like that. But it will skip everything if you don't want to uh, do the storyline or the optional tribal storylines for the different islands and stuff. But regardless, Land Alliance is just it's so well done and everything. It added a lot of really cool new features. Obviously, the Research Institute being the, the highlight feature of Land of Lions. The Research Institute completely changed how we accessed specialists and items. We got the permits for the more Great Easterns to be built and everything. It changed so much of the game. But having said that, it took away a lot. I felt that the Research Institute was the beginning of oversimplifying the game. Before the Research Institute, you had to actually go out and do those expeditions. You had to run those exhibitions at the World's Fair. Getting a legendary specialist was something that you would post on Reddit about, like, I got this thing finally. I finally got a legendary specialist that I've been wanting for, like, you know, the last couple of months, and it changed my entire game. I finally got that Bruno Iron Bright, and I don't need steel for my factories and stuff now. I can just use iron ore, and now I'm getting extra steam motors and advanced weapons from it bruno was amazing to get it was just like a it was like a uh, moment we we're so happy to get it Re the research institute took that it took that bit of excitement out of the game because now it's just a matter of hitting the slot machine until you find all the specialists and then just queue them up and to build them you build more re more scholars to get more research points, and now they're not special anymore. Um, and I think that took a lot away. Uh, I know a lot of people did not like the RNG factor of the 
exhibitions and expeditions and, you know, the public mooring and, you know, trying to build up your attractiveness to attract more better specialists to your public mooring on your islands and stuff like that. A lot of people did not like the RNG of it, especially the, those min max players and those uber efficiency players. They want everything to be laid out perfectly and they don't want to have to play the RNG game in order to min max their game. They want something that's just going to be like clockwork to make it uh, do uh, make it work the way they want, which is what the research institute gave them. But I do feel like it took away some of the fun of the game, and it took away a lot of the fun of it. Uh, obviously, you don't have to do those things. I, I know that you don't have to do the research institute. Typically, when I play, I don't use the research institute to make specialists. I only use it to uh, create like advanced peers and uh, permits and some stuff like that, moving oil wells around and stuff. I don't use it for specialists, but I feel like it's become a crutch for a lot of people. And most people don't do a lot of that other content anymore because all they have to do is build the Institute and go for it. Uh, so with all that being said, I am going to put the Land of Lions under the A tier. Um, it is a really good DLC. It added a lot to the game. It was an amazing, amazing storytelling. Uh, the Research Institute is really good, but it did take away so much of what I felt made the game unique and fun and exciting. So I, I, I would put it in B tier, but I feel like, like half of you would unsub for me if I, if I said the Research Institute belonged to the B tier. So I will put it in the A tier, but I, I feel like it took so much away from the game that I don't feel like it could be S tier because it... Um, Instead of adding to the game, it's it took a lot away, in my opinion, and kind of made things too easy. All right, starting off in Season 3, we have Docklands. Oh, Docklands. Oh, where am I going to put you? Okay, so Docklands obviously was similar to the Research, Research Institute. One of those massive game-changing systems. Um, completely cut out the need for a lot of... You know, production chains, because now you can import that stuff by overproducing other goods and exporting it. So it added an entirely new system that we've not had before in any Anno game in order to obtain goods. It was a very different system. It was really cool. The problem with Docklands was I don't think one hand was talking to another when they were developing it. And I don't think they took into account how specialists would affect things like Docklands. Looking at you, Bruno Ironbright, and Bicycle Factories. Um, being able to pump out advanced weapons and steam motors like so quickly, and then using those to export, and then you start doing the arbitrage system where you are importing... You're importing like goods on this island right here, and you're over importing one thing on one island to send to another island to use those goods to import something cheaper it's a whole system back and forth of you know cyclical importing and exporting where you're not actually producing anything you're using your imports to actually create more exports and on different islands and it creates this whole system you can do or you can just overproduce one thing and import whatever you want I almost, I, I really hate to say it, but I'm not a big fan of Docklands. Uh, it's really, really good. And it is a game-changing DLC, but is it, a, is it a game-changing DLC for the better? I know most people are going to say yes. I'm going to say maybe. If it wasn't for, you know, how specialists interacted. The specialists and stuff are their whole other, specialists is a whole other video. I could sit and probably rant for about an hour on specialists. Um, but you know, the way the specialist interacted and how Docklands was set up, I don't think it was in, I don't think it was actually thought through very well. And they just kind of threw it in there and went with it. But I will say that Docklands is an S tier because it is such a game changing system once you unlock it early in the artisan phase. Because as soon as you unlock that, you can start exporting goods. Um, I usually like to hurry up and start exporting like, you know, sewing machines or fur coats and importing, you know, some of my raw materials and stuff in to free up space for, from farms and everything. So Docklands is massively game changing. It is what it is at this point. It, 
for better or for worse. But it did completely revolutionize how we managed our production chains in the game. So with that, I feel like it definitely belongs under the S tier. Which is probably surprising for a lot of people because I rail against Docklands all the time. But I will be honest that it is an S tier DLC because of how much it changed the game. So next up we have Tourist Season. So Tourist Season came uh, right after Docklands in the middle of Season 3. And it's kind of one of those hit or miss DLCs. It's fun. It's different. It does add the uh, food and drink venues, which can uh, massively decrease your consumption rates and everything uh, for various goods. The biggest problem with Tourist Season is the number of hotels that you have to have. Uh, in order to have all the needs unlocked for the tourists, as well as having enough tourists to fully staff the Iron Tower, which you build as your monument for the uh, DLC, you're going to need somewhere around 15 hotels. The hotels are not small. They are very, very large. I'm not a big fan of the model itself either. And I just am not the biggest fan of how the tourist season stuff was implemented. The bus system is overly complicated. It is, it is so overly complicated with the bus system and trying to figure out, you know, the distance between the bus stations and, you know, this bus station, the, 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 the range from it starts one tile on the edge. And then the bus station on this side, the range stops one tile from the edge. And then the cultural buildings or whatever else that you're trying to connect to the bus station needs to be within this many tiles of it. But then the hotel will only pick the hotel, the bus station with the cultural building that it needs, that it's close. It's so complicated and it's, it's over-engineered is basically what it comes down to. The bus system was over-engineered and made too complicated. The hotels were not done very well. I felt the hotels should have held at least three times the number of population they sh or had different models or smaller models, something. 15 hotels is way too much. And this is where kind of going back to sunken treasures, you can almost tell that this DLC was built around having Crown Falls. Having 15 hotels on a standard large island, plus the Iron Tower, plus all the population, like regular population of, you know, farmers up to investors on a large island, you're taking up so much room and it doesn't really work. It just doesn't work very well. You're wasting a lot of space, basically. And it's almost like Crown Falls was meant to be where you build all of this stuff because you can spread everything out. You can spread stuff out and not have everything so crammed together. Um... The consumption rates for the tourists are fairly high, especially for their luxury needs. And the goods are in ma need so much space. The orchards are absolutely insane on how much space you need. It's not so bad now because they finally added in items after quite a bit of complaining from the community. Later on, they added in some items to help with the production of uh, orchard goods. But the orchards were not very well implemented at all. And the DLC overall was just kind of meh yes the consumption reduction recipes from the bars cafes and restaurants are nice but the combinations most of the time don't make sense like for example at the restaurant you can decrease the consumption of sausage chocolate and schnapps now the chocolate and schnapps that okay that's great for the workers but a 15 percent reduction of chocolate that only affects investors so, and so you're doing all of this just to, it, it doesn't make any sense. The, the combination of goods is kind of all over the place. And for the most part, it's, it's way too much just to try to get a small reduction to have these things everywhere. So the recipes aren't very well balanced and don't make a lot of sense to me. Never did. And you need too many hotels. The recipes don't make sense. You need so much space. Uh, the bus system is over-engineered. I, I honestly say the tourist season is a skippable one uh, for the most part, and I really feel like it's a C-tier DLC. It's not that great. 
It's not that game changing. It's not that impactful. So I would say it's kind of just a, a C tier. It's not a, it's not that bad. It's not that great, but you know, it's not terrible, but eh, whatever. Now next up we have the High Life DLC. So the High Life DLC, the final DLC of season three, uh is one that was a little controversial at first because not shortly before High Life was announced, a mod author actually created skyscrapers as mods. They created a version of investors that could be upgraded into skyscrapers and they added their own skyscraper mod. And then suddenly we have the High Life DLC, which brought in skyscrapers, which looks very, 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 very similar to what the mod author created. It was a little controversial, although it kind of blew over pretty quickly. Um, and the highlight DLC is, again, not bad. It's a good DLC. It added in the shopping arcades, which uh, improved on the uh, consumption reduction uh, idea of the bars, cafes, and restaurants from tourist season. And they had better coverages and coverages that made a lot more sense in what they would uh, reduce on consumption. So you could place them a little more strategically and get better value from the space taken up for it and everything. The high rises themselves uh, had the panorama effect, which was not over engineered like the bus system was. It was very simple and very straightforward and made a lot more sense on how to get the panorama effect working by combining different heights. I mean, it was simple. Taller building gets better, better panorama effect than a building shorter next to it because it can see more. That's all it is. It was very simple. It was very well done. My only real complaint about the high life is that the buildings became too tall. A tier five investor skyscraper to me is a huge eyesore on the skyline. And now that is a completely personal opinion. Okay. It's a very personal opinion. I, I'm not playing anno 1920 here. Okay. I'm playing anno 1800. And I know that we're going from the 18, early 1800s to the late 1800s. And now we've moved into the early 1900 uh, time period in terms of, you know, technology and everything else like that. But I just don't think the skyscrapers look that good. Um, the models for the investor skyscrapers, I felt, were very dull. Because it was just the, the it, they, they just looked funny. I, I don't even know how to describe it, but they just looked funny to me. Because, like, you know, we had all these awesome skins packs that had come out with the Vibrant Cities pack and everything to make all our cities look really cool with brick buildings or colorful buildings. But they didn't apply those to the skyscrapers. So then we get now we're reverting from all of these really cool skins that we have for our skyscrapers back to just white investor buildings. And it was that was a big disappointment for a lot of us that they did not Im uh, put the skins from vibrant cities onto the high life buildings. And they said it was simply just because of time. They didn't have time to do it, which I understand. Uh, but it took a mod author, I think maybe a month or so to be able to implement all of the vibrant city skins onto it. So they could have had someone work on it. One person could have worked on that later. So the High Life uh, gave us the skyscrapers, gave us the shopping arcades, gave us the Skyline Tower, uh, which was really cool. But it did change the skyline completely of the city, and it went from a very 1800s, um, you know, Parisian, uh, London-looking city to more of a Chicago 1920s-looking city with high-rises and the totally not Empire State Building from New York rising above the city. Which kind of looked funny to me next to the, you know, a very Baroque palace and the uh, World's Fair and stuff. It didn't fit. It doesn't fit the aesthetic that I feel the game was originally going for. But that's a personal opinion of mine. But I feel like overall, it was an okay DLC. It wasn't game changing. Um, it wasn't crazy different. And it was okay. You know, it's, it's a middle of the pack. It's good. It's not amazing. It's not terrible. It's an average, decent DLC. It's a B-tier DLC. The final season for Anno 1800 is uh, season four. 
and the first DLC was Seeds of Change. Seeds of Change was nicknamed the Bright Harvest for the New World. It added in the Hacienda mechanic, which uh, changed how we handle our farms and stuff. It added some new production types, several new fertilities that we had to work with and everything. So it was a really cool DLC. The Hacienda itself was decent. Unfortunately, the Hacienda quarters, uh, through some experimenting, was discovered to be very inefficient. Yes, they held more people, but in terms of it, it, it comes down to a min-max thing uh, in terms of the number of tiles required. To reach the population that a standard 3x3 three three, uh, residential house would take up. Because you also have to add in now that you need more production. The Hacienda Quarters need the hot sauce and aioli sauce. Which takes up even more room, so even more farms and even more people. So they're not efficient and most people won't build them for the population. Because you need so much of the other stuff. Plus, not to mention, that hot sauce is in such high demand. Like, what are they doing with that hot sauce? Seriously, it's stupid. But, but beyond that, the farming changes that the Seeds of Change brought uh, with the smaller 64 tile farms, as well as the dung and the fertilizer silos and everything else, was absolutely amazing. And it definitely belongs up here in the S tier. Now, next we have Empire of the Skies. And now this is one I'm probably going to ruffle a few feathers on. I hate this DLC. I hate Empire of the Skies. Okay, I do. I just, I hate it. It was a rushed DLC, in my opinion. Empire of the Skies was a very rushed DLC. Airships are cool. They're flashy. They're neat. They're fun to look at. They can completely change how you do your trade routes and everything. That's fine. That's great. The airship's fine. Whatever. It's literally the rest of the DLC that is garbage. The mail mechanic is absolute garbage to deal with. Trying to manage mail for large populations, and I'm talking hundreds of thousands into the millions, which plenty of people reach those numbers, is next to impossible. It is so next to impossible to manage the mail for those large populations because of how they did the... Um, quote, male alchemy, that they, uh, which is what they refer to it as, um, and how the male has to transform so you can't, you know, double back male onto your own island and stuff like that. It's, it's all over the place. But the way the male system was done was really garbage, honestly. I hated the male system. Um, I don't like playing with it. Um, it's just, it's, local male is fine. Local male is great. Regional is okay, but once you start trying to do international and you have huge populations, it just becomes a nightmare. The airship platform is woefully underdeveloped. Uh, we needed airship platform peers, essentially, for airmail to be able to go to. Because if you have huge populations and they're all trying to, all these airmail routes are going to a single platform and they sit there and they sit there and the loading times take forever, no matter how much you increase it because you can only increase it so much it's just not good it's just not good the mail system was not done well i don't like playing with it uh the ai being able to use airships was a massive mistake by the uh development team the ai being able to use airships and drop propaganda or happy stuff or whatever on your cities is so annoying and what i mean by that is Sometimes Benta, I like playing with Benta. She's a cool AI, but she likes to drop uh, positive productivity stuff on my factories. I don't want it because she's dropping those over and over and increasing the productivity by 50%, which sounds great until I realize that she's only dropping it on like this random set of factories over here. And now my entire production chain is screwed up because she has increased the productivity by 50%. So now I have to go and modify my, all my input productions to match the 50%. And then randomly she stops dropping propaganda. And now I'm overproducing all this stuff. And it's, I hate it. I hate it. I hate it. I hate it. The AI should not have been allowed to build airships. Simple as that. Or at least let them build airships. They shouldn't have been allowed to build the... Um, 
the the supply drop the, the the package drop factory whatever it's called the factory that lets them build the different things that they can drop like propaganda and leaflets and all that kind of stuff they should not have been allowed to build that particular building if they want to build airships you know because they we we can build like you know gun airships so i obviously the ai should be able to build something to defend so fine whatever don't let them do the drops the drop thing was terrible it's a horrible idea to let them the ai do that because it's such a headache to deal with i don't like that i don't like the mail system um the new the new combat stuff they added in with the flame turrets and all this stuff are massively overpowered and they're so stupid. The, the blue flak monitor or the, the blue flame monitor is so OP. It's so stupid. Um, they, I, I don't know what, I think, I don't know what they were doing when they developed this DLC, but it was not good. Um, I don't like it. I think it's a terrible DLC and it's one you can easily skip. Be aware, though, that the lifestyle needs is not part of this DLC. A lot of people don't understand that. The lifestyle needs is base game. The only thing that Empire of the Sky adds is mail to the lifestyle needs. So you can get access to the lifestyle needs without this DLC. I hate to say it, but I am going to put Empire of the Sky as a D tier. It's not a, very, it's not a good DLC to me. It, um, it, it causes more headaches for people than anything, trying to manage mail, trying to manage the AI dropping stuff. I mean, I can't even tell my, my, an ally to stop dropping things on my city. It's so, it's so terrible. It was very, very poorly implemented. And I'm not, I just don't think it's a good DLC. If you love airships, definitely get it, but you, you're going to be fine without it. Last but not least, we have New World Rising, a much requested DLC uh, focusing on the New World and expanding all of our options in the New World with a new residential tier, uh, more production chains, and lots of new toys over there to play with, as well as the island of Manoa, which was billed as a continental-sized island a la Crown Falls for us to build on as well as electricity in the New World, which was, again, another much-requested feature. New World Rising... <clears throat> I thought New World Rising was really well done. I really enjoyed the Artistas. I enjoyed their production chains. They were challenging. They were actually pretty challenging production chains to set up and get running. And I felt very accomplished once I had it all done, and it made me feel good. And I really liked the look of the Artista buildings and having them all put in there and making our new worlds feel a little bit more advanced. My only real somewhat gripe with the New World Rising is that I feel like the technology level presented in New World Rising uh, really outpaced what we see in the old world. I mean, they've got, you know, desk fans and scooters and all kinds of stuff. And in the old world, they're still basically the, the biggest technology that they have for the residents in the old world is the steam carriage still. So, yeah, I feel like, you know, technology wise, they kind of push the envelope a little too far for New World Rising. But it's still it's a fun DLC. Um, Manola is great. It's not nearly as big as it was really led on to believe to um, to appear to be. The vast majority of Manola is unbuildable terrain, so there's only really a small percentage of it that you can build on. I'd say maybe two large islands worth of space, roughly. So not a, not the biggest amount of space, but it's still a nice island. I really like the dam, being able to get that built and supply the entire island with electricity. I thought that was really cool. So I thought it was a really well done DLC, um, definitely an S tier DLC in terms of, you know, because it, it, it completely changes the new world and it brings so much to the new world that was needed. So with that, I definitely think that is an S tier kind of DLC because it, it, it gets that capstone to the game and polishes off a region that needed that little bit of polishing. And that's it, guys. That is my tier list for all the DLC for Anno 1800. Let me know down below your thoughts in this. I know some people are going to be mad about Empire of the Skies, but, you know, I'm sorry. Just don't feel like it really passed the bar that a lot of other DLCs did uh, just because of all the problems that it has. It's it, The airships are fun, guys. I know they're fun. They're cool looking. But 
cool just doesn't ma always make a good DLC, especially when the rest of the content is really lackluster. So with that, guys, thank you so much for watching, and I hope to see you in the next video. Until then, take care.